Ali Ayajitam III and other traditional rulers, fellow Ghanaians, ladies and gentlemen. It is always a great pleasure to be amongst a gathering of fellow lawyers. And once again, I thank the Bar Council most heartily for the invitation to be part of this year's Bar Conference. I want to record also my appreciation to the Council for making me a member in permanent good standing, i.e. one who does not have to pay dues. It is an enviable status, one which I cherish. My memories of bar councils, bar conferences past, are full of the struggles and joys that mark my years of practice and involvement in politics. Never a dull moment, I suppose, will best describe those days. There was always something that we had up our sleeves. We felt we had to be true to the pioneers of the profession in Ghana, who were nationalists and did not limit the work or, or influence of the lawyer to the narrow interpretation of the practice of the law. They saw law as an integral part of all human existence. Some of the most exciting moments of my life have played out during bar conferences. It is from this perspective that I speak and say that the theme you have chosen for this year's conference, ensuring an increase in revenue mobilization through taxation for the purpose of accelerated national development, the role of the lawyer, must surely be one of the bravest that has been taken. Reading your letter of invitation and the theme of the conference brought a warm feeling to my heart, for it showed that this generation of lawyers is as nationalistic in outlook as any of the earlier generations were. I believe there's a saying, and if there's not, there should be, that you can only fight the battles that you meet. The early lawyers were confronted with colonialism and went with enthusiasm into the battle for the fight for national freedom and independence. When we had governance issues, the latter lawyers took up the fight for personal freedoms, human rights, and civic liberties. Bar conferences became concerned with constitutional rule, freedom of the press, independence of the judiciary, and other matters that were of paramount concern and interest to the citizens who wanted to live under a governance structure that was insulated from authoritarian rule, whether of the one party, union government, or military variety. The bar joined wholeheartedly in the search of the people for democratic governance, where power emanates from the open decision of the ballot box, not from the coercive force of the gun secretly undertaken behind the backs of the people. Next year, will mark the 30th anniversary of the historic choice made by the Ghanaian people on 28th April 1992, when in the referendum of that day, they expressed overwhelmingly by a 92.6% margin their commitment to democratic governance under a constitution that guarantees the full enjoyment of fundamental human rights and civic liberties. The decision has ushered, ushered our nation into the longest uninterrupted period of stable constitutional democratic governance in her history, which has experienced under the Fourth Republic three peaceful transfers of power through the ballot box on three separate occasions. The anti-democrats who are always looking for occasions to snare at democratic governance should also bear the following data in mind. The 1970s and 1980s, the periods of unbridled authoritarian rule on the continent, were the eras of economic decline, worsening poverty, collapsing infrastructure, 
and insecurity on our continent. GDP per capita in 1970, for example, according to the World Bank, stood at $220. The third wave of democratization on the continent, beginning in the 1990s, saw GDP per capita rise substantially to $605 in United States dollars in 1995, declined marginally to $547 in the year 2000, and in 2017, increased to 1,550 United States dollars. In Ghana, it was $398 in 1990, declined to $258 in 2000, and it is now 2,223 United States dollars. Another key index of human development, life expectancy at birth, was estimated by the World Bank at 45 years in 1970 in sub-Saharan Africa. By 1990, this had increased to 50 years, and in 2019, life expectancy at birth on the continent was 61 years. In Ghana, it was 49 years in 1970 and 64 years in 2019. According to data from the World Bank, gross primary school enrollment in sub-Saharan Africa in 1970 stood at 54% and had increased to 98.9% in 2019. It was 64% for us in Ghana and by 2019 was 105%. The implementation of the free senior high school policy has brought 1.2 million Ghanaian children into the education ecosystem, the highest number of students in secondary school in Ghana's history, 400,000 of whom would otherwise have been excluded. The National Health Insurance Scheme is operating more adequately and is enjoying the confidence of the increasing number of its users, with the number of active members up from 10.6 million in 2016 to 12.3 million at the end of 2019. The goal in sight is to attain universal health coverage for all. Clearly, democracy has been beneficial for the continent and for our country. We know, however, that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance, and vigilant we shall be here in Ghana. We shall not let our guard down and allow the clammy embrace of the people by anti-democrats who are disdainful and incapable of effective popular mobilization through accepted channels but who wants shortcuts to power without the express support of the people. Today, there is no question but that the most important thing on most people's minds is the need for accelerated national development to improve living standards and generate jobs for the mass of the people, especially the youth. On that question, we are all agreed. However, not everyone is ready to take the next step to the recognition that accelerated national development can best take place with a dynamic increase, with a dramatic increase in revenue mobilization. And very few will then take the next further step to accept that revenue mobilization will happen principally through taxation. In our society, we have unfortunately not yet reached the stage of universal acceptance of taxation as a matter of public good. Fellow members of the bar, it is most reassuring that you have chosen to place the lawyer right in the middle of the process for revenue mobilization. Taxation is not popular and was the Achilles heel of all colonial powers throughout history. I hasten to add that it is not only a Ghanaian phenomenon for people to be unenthusiastic about paying, paying taxes. As Benjamin Franklin, 
One of America's founding fathers put it in one of his famous quotes. Taxes are not something that people look forward to. He put it in the same bracket as death. With your indulgence, let me state the full quotation. Because I believe the situation Benjamin Franklin faced and described in 1789, a decade or so after the inauguration of the American Republic, is not very different from ours. He said, and I quote, Our new constitution is now established and has an appearance that promises permanency. But in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes, unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, our Constitution also now promises permanency, having lasted despite various challenges for 29 years. Death has not changed its certainty. It will come when it will. The only thing we have not done is to make taxes regular, predictable parts of our lives. It is time to make the payment of taxes a certainty in our society. Our tax to, our tax to GDP ratio of 14.3% compares unfavorably with our peers the world over. The average tax to GDP ratio in West Africa stands at 18%. And indeed, the recommended ratio for West Africa ECOWAS, for ECOWAS member states is at least 20%. The average for OECD countries is 34%. It is thus no wonder that American, German, French, Japanese, and British peoples, amongst others, can readily find the means to fund their own development particularly their infrastructural development, whereas we are constantly struggling to do the same. There is therefore an urgent need to enhance significantly our capacity for domestic revenue mobilization to realize our development potential, create opportunities for our vibrant youth, our vibrant and dynamic youth, and deliver improved livelihoods for our fellow citizens. The necessity for increased mobilization of resources for national development is crucial. It can no longer wait. There are critical needs in all sectors in all parts of the country, not too far from where we are gathered. Torrential rains have caused havoc and washed away bridges and roads. Farms have been destroyed and investments have disappeared under floodwaters. These are just new additions to an already difficult situation of a long list of infrastructural deficits that require a lot of money for their elimination. COVID-19 has brought extra devastation to our economies, and we have not seen the end of it to be able to say we can start counting our losses. The only certainty we do have is that we need a lot of resources to engender the rebuilding of the economy. Hence the exceptional significance of government's Ghana Cares or Baltampa program, which is seeking to raise 100 and million billion CDs from both domestic, from both public and private sectors to finance the revitalization of our post-COVID economy. I'm glad that the bar has decided to enlist the undoubted strength of lawyers to help in the mobilization of resources through taxation. We must admit, though, that usually when lawyers are mentioned in relation to taxes, it is not in the best of lights. The tax lawyer is more often than not seen as the person that is helping people to escape pain, what should properly be due to the state. The whole world has heard about the exploits of the famous tax lawyers that make it possible for the big companies to escape paying anything like what they should otherwise have to. They are the same tax lawyers 
who help billionaires pay less taxes. We heard the other day the astonishing news that some billionaires in the United States of America pay almost no income taxes and have one or two politicians pay the level of taxes they are ashamed to make public. There is one thing we do know, and in the unlikely event we do not know, we would have to accept quickly. We can never and should never forget the reality of our geography and our history. For the moment, we have work to do to convince the people of Ghana that if we are to get the developments we all crave, then paying taxes must become a regular and unquestioning feature of our lives. I do not suggest that lawyers take a vow of poverty and not make money, honest money, out of practicing, practicing as tax lawyers. As long as there are taxes, there will be tax lawyers, and there will always be a, a requirement for tax law expertise. Taxes can be confusing at times, and a good tax lawyer can guide and help keep businesses afloat or families' finances intact. It is at this time when we're trying to build a culture of paying taxes that we have a special demand for lawyers who would inspire confidence in the people that it is worth doing. I would dare say that the theme you have chosen for the conference ensuring an increase in revenue mobilization through taxation for the purpose of accelerated de national development, the role of the lawyer, is as relevant to cl a clarion call for our times as self-government now or self-government within the shortest possible time, depending on your inclination, was for our forefathers. 64 years after we achieved our independence, nobody needs to tell us that today's battle cry is indeed for accelerated national development. And it is heartening that within its finest tradition, the bar, as usual, is taking the lead in this important national exercise. Having spoken at length about how far-sighted it is for the bar to have taken this decision to support efforts to increase, increase revenue mobilization through taxation. I trust I'll be allowed to go a step further into more uncomfortable territory. I have to point out that if this campaign you're undertaking is to be successful, you will have to start from home. Mr. Outgoing President of the Bar, I'm afraid there's no easy way of putting this. You will have to start from getting members of the bar to pay their taxes. The record of lawyers in paying taxes has been historically poor. It is unfortunate, but a most unpleasant fact, that members of the professions in our country have not been known to set a good example when it comes to paying taxes. They appear to think that being members of the learned professions put them above complying with everyday civic duties, like paying taxes. It is embarrassing. The lawyers are often at the top of the list of those who flout our tax laws and use their expertise to avoid paying taxes. The Ghana Revenue Authority has told a disturbing story about what it discovered earlier this year when it started working with the Registrar General's Department and the National Identification Authority. It found that there are some 60,000 professionals working in the country who are totally outside the purview of the tax authorities. These professionals are lawyers. They are accountants. They are doctors. They are engineers. They are surveyors. They are architects. In other words, they are part of the creme de la creme of Ghanaian society, and they do not pay taxes. They will soon be receiving friendly phone calls from the tax authority. I sincerely hope that those involved would move swiftly to regularize 
their tax affairs before the GRA moves to crack the whip. Indeed, prior to my coming to office in 2017, only a small proportion of our population, i.e. some 750,000 people, was registered by GRA with tax identification numbers 10. As a result of the effective rollout of the national identification card, spearheaded by one of our own, the Balian Kenatifwa, which has been integrated with GRA to form the TIN number. We now have a taxable population of some 15.5 million people in just four years. Government has introduced other measures that make it easy for institutions and individual taxpayers to be compliant. These include implementing initiatives such as revenue assurance and compliance enforcement, race, Ghana.gov, paperless port, the National ID Ghana card, digital property and address system, and cashless system. These policy interventions are running smoothly, and I urge you to take advantage of these innovations to regularize your tax affairs and advise your clients to do the same. The integrated customs management system ICOMS at our ports has been introduced to facilitate trade and block revenue leakages. Already, despite the initial opposition of vested interests, it is paying dividends. Customs revenue prior to the implementation of ICOMS for the period June 2019 to May 2020 stood at 11.25 billion CDs. Between June 2020, the start of ICONS, and May 2021, teething challenges, ill-considered propaganda, and the impact of COVID-19 on global trade notwithstanding, customs revenue has increased by 27.6% to 14.36 billion CDs. Additionally, government is exploring data warehousing, data matching, and artificial in intelligence to identify tax defaulters. Whilst government narrows the fiscal gap by implementing target revenue generating initiative, much is also expected from taxpayers to be responsive in equal measure for the speedy full re realization of moving Ghana to a situation beyond aid. When I say the bar is demonstrating courage by getting into the subject of taxes, I do not exaggerate. I wish all of us a lot of luck, and I shall be watching keenly how this project progresses. Before I end, I must make a comment on the choice of Bogotanga as the site for this year's bar's conference. It is the third time in my recollection that the conference is being held in the northern sector of our country, after Tamale in 2000 and 2010. I congratulate you for venturing out of your comfort zone and coming to Bogotanga, even though there's in fact nothing difficult about the location of the conference. I see. I see that these very pleasant premises have been aptly named by their founder, the celebrated priest, the Reverend Eastwood Anaba, who gave such an inspiring opening prayer for this conference in this magnificent auditorium, Desert Pastures. And I cannot think of a more suitable name to call this beautiful and well-ordered place. I'm hopeful that it has encouraged those lawyers who stay only in Accra and other big cities and imagine the rest of our country to be thatched roof mud houses to explore other parts of our country. You will discover, yes, we have problems, but we are also making steady progress. May God bless the Ghana Bar Association and us all, and may God bless our homeland Ghana 
and make her great and strong. I thank you very much for your attention. All distribution, which means all parts of the country have been touched by our policies, and we have delivered value for money. I take pride in the fact the free SHS and free TVET have been delivered, and our young people and their parents and guardians know that they will no longer be forced to stop school at JHS level because of financial difficulties. It was not easily done, and so we intend to protect it and prevent any so-called review, another word for cancellation. We have no reason to believe the NDC presidential candidate's newly proclaimed conversion to free SH and free TVET. For eight years, he and his party were loud in their assertions that they did not believe in free SHS and free TVET. They did not like the idea, they rubbished it at every opportunity, and they proclaimed that it would destroy Ghana's educational system. When they were in office, they had a hard time trying to run even their watered-down version of their so-called progressively free education. Then the former president said he would review it, and now we hear him say it has come to stay. Excellency, please try another one. Your credibility on this one is zero. Free SHS and free TV cannot be trusted in your hands. In much the same way, we would not risk putting agriculture under the NDC and its leader. They will once again leave the farmers on their own, without the support that is helping to make farming the profitable and fulfilling business it should be. And why should anyone imagine that an NDC administration under the former president would treat businesses any differently from what they did the last time round. Fellow Ghanaians, in, in spite of the unexpected and dramatic entry into our lives by COVID-19 and the subsequent worldwide devastation, we can demonstrate that we have set the economy on a strong foundation and businesses will flourish. The virus has slowed us down, but it has not di diverted us from the path of growth we have put the country on. It is interesting to note that the NDC in opposition is not able to take the lead in doing some of the things that are most often done, first by parties in opposition. You might remember how long it took the NDC presidential candidate to find a running mate. If they have not yet got a manifesto, I wonder what will happen the day they have a government to run as well. Or maybe it is simply showing that the country, they do not attach much importance to a manifesto, nor should we expect that whatever is written in it will reflect their beliefs, which presupposes, of course, that they now have or hold on to any firm beliefs instead of bending in the direction of whatever they think is currently fashionable. We wish them luck with their manifesto whenever they are done with it. We in the MPP know from whence we came. We have never had any identity crisis. And our manifesto always gives us the opportunity to reiterate our historic stand as the party of the rule of law the party of good governance, the party of business, the party that builds and creates wealth 
the party of social justice and the party that cares for every Ghanaian. In other words, it helps to believe in something, to spend time and energy to think it through, and to get passionate and competent people to lead in the implementation of the program. On the day of my acclamation as the presidential candidate of our party, for which I continue to express my deep gratitude to Almighty God and to the myriad of officials and faithful supporters of our great party, I said that there was a clear choice before our nation as the two main candidates could be a judge on similar basis. The people of Ghana could decide who among the two had made a better job of governing our country as president. I know that the NDC presidential candidate, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, believes and says often that Ghanaians have a short memory. And he must hold strongly to this belief. Otherwise, I doubt he would have summoned the courage to be seeking another turn after the disaster that was his presidency. <laughs> Ghanaians may, might have short memories, but not short enough for us to have forgotten the broken down freezers, irons, and other household equipment thanks to the five years of Dumso. Our memories are not short enough to forget that the economy under him was such a wreck that there was a ban placed on all recruitment into our public services. Our memories are not short enough to forget that teachers taught for three years and were only paid for three months. Our memories are certainly not short enough to forget that he brought our entire financial services system to near collapse. I've heard him make the extraordinary claim that Ghana's economy was in, quote, tatters, not because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but because of mismanagement. I doubt that he can recognize a well-managed economy, even if it slapped him in the face. <laughs> Luckily for us, we do not have to rely on his judgment or assessment of the economy, but it's important to tell him, just in case there are others like him around, that Ghana is today in a position to be able to provide one hot meal for JHS3 students who, go, who are back in school in the midst of the pandemic, to pay for six months the water bills of all Ghanaians, to subsidize the electricity bills of all Ghanaians for three months. Indeed, we thank the Almighty that the pandemic did not strike under his presidency when there was no money in the national kitty to pay teachers and nurses allowances. We are very much aware of the realities of the times. We know the havoc that COVID-19 has wrecked on our economies and livelihoods. I've asked our party members to keep these sensibilities in their minds in all they do as they are about campaigning for votes. Adherence to the COVID-19 protocols means we cannot resort to the traditional methods of campaigning, and I urge all of us to obey strictly these rules. We cannot have the traditional crowds and the rallies, and whenever there are gatherings, we have to try to observe the social distancing rules. It has been said by the NDC presidential candidate that NPP policies lack sense. If running an emerging oil economy into the arms of the IMF because of indiscipline in the management of the public finances is sense, I'm happy that the NPP has another concept of sense. <laughs> if having sense means cancelling teacher, trainee, and nurses' allowances is sense, 
I'm happy that the MPP has another concept of sense. If having sense means recording the worst economic management statistics of modern times with the lowest rate of growth of the last 30 years, I'm happy the MPP has another concept of sense. <laughs> having sense in the MPP means being able to take an economy growing at 3.4% to an economy that grew, on the average, for three successive years, at least 7% per year before the pandemic, and was rightly acknowledged as one of the best performing economies, not just in Africa, but also in the world. Having sense in the MPP means executing the program for planting for food and jobs, which has led to the revival of Ghanaian agriculture from the doldrums of the NDC years, bringing in its wake, bumper harvests, and affordable food prices in our markets, and exports of significant quantities of foodstuffs to our nurses, which according to the latest Ghana Living Standards Survey, has re resulted in a decline in unemployment rates from 11.9% in 2015 to 7.3% in 2019. I am happy with and prefer the MPP's sense. Let me use this occasion to assure the Ghanaian people that as President of the Republic, I will do everything within my means to ensure the peace and stability of our country in the run up to, during, and after the polls of 7th December. 2020. The struggle of our forebears in the Dankwa Domo Buzia political tradition to construct a great sacrifice, a democratic, open, free system of government in Ghana will not be jeopardized by me. And I'm calling on all actors in the political space to join me to ensure the maintenance of the peace and stability of our country and to conduct ourselves in a manner devoid of violence and ethnocentrism. The Ghana project can best be achieved in unity, tolerance and mutual respect. Fellow Ghanaians, the MPP has in 2020 one target and one objective only that is to secure, with your support and the blessing of the Almighty, in free, fair, peaceful and transparent elections, another decisive victory on 7 December 2020. <laughs> a victory that will give us a clear majority in Parliament and a first round presidential victory. And, able, and enable us to do four more years of advancing the peace, progress, and prosperity of our nation for you. We have an excellent message as set out in our manifesto, leadership of service, protecting our progress, transforming Ghana for all. <laughs> And as eloquently articulated by that brilliant Ghanaian, Mohamedou Bawumia, my most esteemed running mate and vice president, <laughs> which will protect our progress and continue down the path of social and economic transformation on which all Ghanaians are now embarked. Fellow Ghanaians, the battle remains the Lord's. It is four more years for Nana and the MPP to do more for you. May God bless the new patriotic party and us all. And may God bless our homeland Ghana and make her great and strong. I thank you for your attention. The president has spoken. 
Mr. Yufi Grant, for initiating this summit, which is aimed at stimulating one of the most important conversations we should be having in this country, that is making registered investments real on the ground in Ghana. When I assumed office in January 2017, I encouraged all of us to take it upon ourselves to help government build a business-friendly economy that will enable our nation to get to the stage where the exploitation of the opportunities that are available to us will help us build an optimistic we should be having in this country that is making registered investments real on the ground in Ghana. When I assumed office in January 2017, I encouraged all of us to take it upon ourselves to help government build a business-friendly economy that will enable our nation to get to the stage where the exploitation of the opportunities that are available to us will help us build an optimistic, self-confident, self-reliant and prosperous nation, a Ghana beyond aid. Towards realizing this vision, the government has made deliberate efforts at, at determining the investment priorities of our country and taken steps to mobilize the necessary resources for the growth of these priority areas. This is because we want to help transform Ghana from being a mere producer and exporter of raw materials to a value-added industrialized economy that will provide opportunities, jobs, and prosperity for all Ghanaians, thereby creating a wiser nation that is a wealthy, inclusive, sustainable, empowered, and resilient one. Government since 2017 has put in place measures needed to reduce the cost of doing business, improve the business environment, and made the Ghanaian economy not only one of the most business-friendly economies in Africa, but also one of the fastest growing economies in the world between 2017 and 2020, averaging 7% GDP annual rates of growth up from the 3.4% rate we inherited in 2016. Indeed, with the economies of many countries around the world in recession in 2020, having regarded negative growth largely as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, Ghana's economy was one of the very few that still managed to record a positive GDP growth. That is 0.1% in 2020, albeit significantly reduced from the average levels of 7% per annum that we had become accustomed to in 2017, 2018, and 2019. In spite of the ravages of the pandemic, we are working to grow the economy at a much faster rate this year, our target being a 5% GDP growth rate, which will enhance the prospects of a win-win environment for both private sector and country, and create an environment where companies do not just survive, but actually thrive. In the first quarter of this year, the GDP of the economy grew at 3.1 percent, in the second at 8.9 percent. Government has a blueprint for the revitalization of the Ghanaian economy from the effects of COVID-19. We have identified the relevant sectors of, our, of the economy requiring the needed investment that will help accelerate the rebound and growth of the Ghanaian economy, as was witnessed in the immediate years before the pandemic struck. We call it the Ghana Cares or Bantampa program. The 100 billion CD program 
will require some 30 billion CDs of funding from government and 70 billion CDs from the private sector. The program focuses on in injecting substantial investments into key sectors of our economy, such as agriculture, agro-processing, manufacturing, healthcare, housing, and infrastructural development. In seeking to mobilize the 70 billion from the private sector, it has become even more important to examine also how foreign direct investments are onboarded into the economy of Ghana. So it is critical that this made in addition of spark up be dedicated to exploring ways of improving the turnaround times and the efficiency with which potential investments are integrated into the Ghanaian economy. The Ghana Investment Promotion Center has been at the forefront of handholding potential investors and working to support their establishment in the Ghanaian economy. Let me thus take this opportunity to congratulate the Center for effectively discharging its mandate and promoting vigorously the considerable investments and business opportunities that exist in Ghana, estimated at some 12 billion United States dollars in foreign direct investments from 2017 to 2020. Whilst global FDI declined by some 42% in 2020 in the midst of COVID-19, FDI inflow recorded by Ghana through the GNPC amounted to some 2.65 billion United States dollars which bucked the global trend, representing a significant increase over the 2019 FDI value. In keeping up with the importance of public-private dialogues, as recommended by the Ministry of Trade and Industry, I'm charging GIPC to use the summit as a platform for open, frank, and solution-oriented engagements between investors, regulators, and investment facilitators. I'm hopeful that it will afford the facilitator agencies, regulators, and the relevant public officials on one side, the opportunity to engage directly with investors and potential investors on the other, to explore how the various bottlenecks that frustrate and slow down potential investments can be quickly unlocked for a smooth, and quick establishment of all these registered investments to complement the efforts of government in engineering growth and the creation of jobs for our people. The ongoing review of the GNP GIPC Law Act 865 and the institutional reforms such as retooling and refocusing the center's operations through the institution of the diaspora investment desk and the CARES delivery unit will be crucial in implementing the outcomes of this summit. They will strengthen GIPC to continue to play a lead role in assisting government to mobilize private sector complementary investments for the resurgence of the Ghanaian economy. Let me commend the collaborating organizations for their roles in this project. The Ministry of Information for showcasing this all-important national conversation. The Ministry of Trade and Industry for articulating the relevant policy direction for attracting the most appropriate investments that Ghana requires at this point in time. And the Ministry for Finance for helping to engender the enabling environment that has made Ghana an attractive investment destination. As host country of the Secretariat of the African Continental Free Trade Area, AFCFTA, now is the time for the Black Star to spark up and bring in the needed investments to accelerate the transformation of the Ghanaian economy and by extension the African one through the active participation of the private sector in the economic development of our country and continent. 
I wish you fruitful deliberations, and may God bless us all in our homeland, Ghana, and make her great and strong. I am guaranteed, I, a guaranteed prescription for maximizing Ghana's investment potential, and the Ministry of Trade and Industry, under the able leadership of the Honorable Minister, will continue to pursue these even more vigorously. Once again, I congratulate the indefatigable Yofi Grant and his team at the GIPC for organizing this summit and urge all of us to walk all the talk. Before the pandemic struck, we call it the Ghana Cares or Bantampa program. The 100 billion CD program will require some 30 billion CDs of funding from government and 70 billion CDs from the private sector. The program focuses on in injecting substantial investments into key sectors of our economy, such as agriculture, agro-processing, manufacturing, healthcare, housing, and infrastructural development. To pay. The US, when they borrow money, they're getting it in 1.5, 1.9 interest rate. Africans, when they get the same amount of money, they're paying 9, 10%. The people who don't need a break, they get a break. The ones who need a break, they don't get a break. The sheer survival of the World Bank IMF is based on the fact that African countries and, and many other developing countries do not succeed. Their success is based on our failure. That has to change. And guess who can make that change? We, the children of Africa, we, the Africans, are the ones who have to say, we know your game now. Enough is enough. We're not playing it anymore. And this is where the diaspora come in. There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in, in the entire country of Ghana. There are more doc Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. So let's be serious here. What Africa needs is capacity, capacity, capacity. And that capacity is in the diaspora. So it behooves us to bring the diaspora together. Let them understand what is really going on in our Africa. Diaspora are not going home. Diaspora are angry about Africa because they are not understanding the root cause of why Africa is where it is today. They think getting rid of a president will take care of the problem. Far from it. That president is just going to be replaced by another one who is going to equally suffer from the same difficult environment to work in. So let's look at an Africa that must be free to take care of herself, an Africa that's free from exploitation from outsiders. The multinationals who are stealing from Africa every day in broad daylight. I use an example of the DRC. If you ever fly very low over the DRC, you'll see tarmacs in the jungle. You'll see 747s flying into DRC, picking up minerals and flying right out. The same multinationals are responsible for arming young people and giving them MK-16s. Because why? Their satellites in the skies are telling them where that village is. There's, there are lots of diamonds. So what do they do? Arm young people, drag them up, and send them to go chop off a few heads. The rest of the village runs away, so they come behind and do their illegal mining. We black people must understand what is really going on. Because what we are shown instead is, oh, look at those Africans killing each other. There are some serious games that have been played in Africa for far too long. And once we understand that, we can strategize as to how we can begin to bring the difference and bring the change that Africa needs. And that change can only come if the African diaspora are united and the Wakanda villages, as I call them. It is our organized way of saying, starting with one African diaspora center of excellence, it will be a new city, a developmental hub that we can then take from there Every sector is developed. Take healthcare. How many doctors do we need in this region to take care of this many people? We pick up education, same thing. We pick up engineering. We pick up electricity. How many megawatts of power do we have in the region? How many do we need? Be it solar, be it wind, be it hydro, be it geothermal, be it nuclear. 